Uh, yes, Nicole. Okay, so thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Vistiju, for making the time to give us this talk today. So just before we start, uh, so the structure of today will be that Vistiju will talk for about 45 minutes. And we'll keep the last 15 or 20 minutes for questions. So during the talk, if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat room, and we'll take it once you've done. So these talks are organized by the Coexistence Consortium. And this consortium is a network of conservation researchers and practitioners who work across different landscapes and different species. So the aim of the consortium is to understand what coexistence is, what it looks like in different contexts, and to help foster coexistence between people and nature. So at the consortium, we believe that coexistence is not limited to communities who live in remote areas and have to share space and resources with wild animals, but it's also very relevant to people living in urban spaces that encounter animals in their towns and cities. So Seema Lokanwala is also part of the consortium, and she will give us a brief introduction about today's talk and also an introduction to this city. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. Am I clearly audible? Yeah. Yes, Seema. So the speaker, Bishwajit Sharma, he is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Motri uh, Satya Narayan Center for Advanced Study in the Humanities and Social Sciences at Kriya University. He has completed his PhD from IIT Guwahati. For his, post -doc uh, for his doctoral research, he wrote an environmental history for, of the Kaziranga National Park in Assam. His research also focuses on ethnographic research as well as extensive, extensive archival work archival work that he did in India, Asia, USA, and the UK. His work has been published in journals like The Environment and History and also Conservation and Society. He is the recipient of the Fulbright Fellow Doctoral Fellowship and also a visiting fellow at the Cornell University in 2019 and 20. Now coming to today's talk. Today, he is going to be talking about the history of the rhino conservation in the Kaziranga National Park in the first 25 years since after the India became independent. In those years, the park was a wildlife sanctuary. It was a very crucial period for a number of reasons, because there were a lot of speculations that since the British have quit India, the wildlife will boom and it will not survive. Against all this pessimism, the rhino did survive. And it did have this first taste of success in reviving an extinct megafauna in the early 60s. On the hindsight, the success has been accomplished with a lot of downsides. There have been large scale poaching that has happened, loss of buffers and corridors. And there has been that impinge conservation today can be traced back to that period. Eventually, by the time Kaziranga became a national park, which is 1974, it had chartered a new approach to conservation. Today's Bishwajit talk will highlight the road to this success and the challenges that the park brought forth from this period towards, conserva towards conservation as well as coexistence. I henceforth uh, invite Bishwajit to please take forward. Thank you. Thank you, Seema uh, and Coexistence Consortium. Shall I go ahead with uh, sharing my screen? Yes, you can. So I assume my screen is uh, visible to all of you. Yes, it's up, Mr. Jeet. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Seema, Nicole, and Coexistence Consortium for having me here. Uh, welcome you all, those who are participating in this talk. Uh, the title of my talk is Reinventing Nature, Rhinoceros Conservation in Kaziranga National Park during 1948 to 1974. I'll begin with a short story. In October 1938, Assam's forest department caught a rhino for the greater one horned rhinoceros in what was then Kaziranga Game Sanctuary. It was caught at the demand of National Geological Park in Washington, D.C. Gunda, as it was named, reached Washington, D.C. in July next year. Forest department asked if they needed more, and the Jew said yes. The second rhino was caught in early 1940 and was sent to Alipur Zoo in Calcutta to be further shipped to Washington, uh, Washington DC, United States. By then, the Second World War had already started. 
the war disrupted all non-military non shipments. The Rhino made its journey after the war ended, but it never reached its destination in the US. This enthusiasm among the Americans to procure rhinos suggests a couple of things to set the tone of my talk today. First, Washington DC Zoo was not adding just one more animal to its stud book. By 1937, there were just two or three rhinos of this species outside the Indian subcontinent. The Americans were uncertain about the rhino's future. They wanted to secure captive rhinos before it went extinct in the wild of the Indian subcontinent. On the other hand, in Assam, the forest officials' eagerness to supply the rhino suggested their optimism about its, about its gradual revival. They considered exporting a few rhinos would earn them some revenue. Let us take a quick snapshot of the park's journey so far. The colonial government first proposed to establish a game reserve to protect the extinct rhino in 1905. It took another two and a half years to issue the final notification of the game reserve in 1908. Two other game reserves were created, one in Laokua and another in Manas at the same time. Since its establishment, Kajiranga had various statuses as game sanctuary to wildlife sanctuary to finally becoming a national park in 1974. Today, Kajiranga is home to nearly two thirds of world's, two -thirds of, uh, world's surviving rhinoceros. The return of the rhino from near extinction is considered to be one of the most remarkable conservation successes of the 20th century. Besides the rhino, <clears throat> besides the rhino and Kajiranga hold a special place in Assam. Rhino protection is an important indicator of a government's performance in the state. Let us have a look at the topography of Kajiranga National Park, where a remarkable success story of conservation was unfolding in the 20th century. The Brahmaputra River flows north of the Kajiranga National Park. In all other directions, it has a narrow plain. In the south and west of these plains, there is a hill range. In the intervening plains between the park and the hills, there is a dense habitation of people and a national highway passes through this. When the park floods during monsoon, wild animals cross these villages and fields to take refuge in the hills in the south. So Kajiranga has striking differences from other famous national parks like Kana or Corbett. While national parks value clearly demarcated boundaries, Kajiranga is in the fluid floodplains of, with porous borders. But why is this period between 1948 to 1974 significant? During this period, Kajiranga transformed from a little known sanctuary to a famous national park. But I have three more nuanced reasons to study this period in some, some greater detail. First, when the British left, there were rights of grazing and fishing inside the sanctuary. The colonial government was flexible in its approach to rhino preservation. To offset the wildlife damage to the cultivators, the government allowed limited grazing and forest produce collection in the sanctuary. The idea was that some concession will bring the villagers' loyalty to protect the rhino. So the post-independence government had to review these pre-existing rights. Secondly, the evidence that the rhino has finally returned from extinction came in the 1960s. The context is important here. It was a time when there was a huge uproar about the vanishing tigers. The lions in the gir forest showed promising signs of revival, but the experts were not calling it a success yet. So the rhino gave India the first taste of success in conserving a big mammal. We are told that the 1970s was the decade of ecological restoration in India. So rhino amends this understanding. Thirdly, Kajiranga is one of the most heavily protected national parks in India. Protection includes intense foot-based patrolling by armed guards, surveillance and communication, and deployment of sophisticated commandos, which has happened recently. In the recent past, there have been controversies around the use of violence against humans to protect the rhino. Seeds for such strict protection were sown in the 1960s. Therefore, in today's presentation, 
I'll show that the years between 1948 and 1974 not only saw the success of rhino conservation, but also a movement towards a new regime of arm and exclusive protection in Kaziranga. In 1948, the government of Assam invited Salim Ali, the great ornithologist from the Bombay Natural History Society, to report on Assam sanctuaries. The context is the context is important again. In another part of the country, the gear lions were struggling to survive when their protector, the Nawab of Junagadh, fled to Pakistan. Now, hunters of all hues wanted their pie of lion trophy. Nehru stepped in to create a context in which the lion got a breather. In contrast, the Assamese politicians were at the hem of this new enthusiasm around the rhino. Who's an Assamese is a politically charged topic with no easy answers. For my presentation today, I refer to the Assamese speaking people. For all other communities within Assam, I'll probably refer to them as Missings, Nepalese, or Karbis, if at all I do. After independence, rhinos began to capture the imagination of Assamese ruling elites. The government of Assam declared the rhino its state symbol and it became a mascot of the Assam State Transport Corporation, as you can see on the bus uh, on your screen. Paradoxically, the rhino never featured in Assamese folklore or imagination before the 1950s. So what led to this paradoxical shift? I began my talk with the story of Gunda, which was sent to Washington DC Zoo. The government of Assam resumed its supply of rhinos after the Second World War ended. The forest department caught rhinos as shown in the image here and loaded them into cages for export. During 1947 and 1951, at least eight rhinos were sent to zoos in India and abroad. By 1961, this number grew to 23 rhinos. The government of Assam earned much needed foreign exchange through these exports. But for the Assamese people, the export of the rhino far exceeded the economic gains they made. Let us understand with this example. This is Kansiram, which is caught in Kaziranga and it reached Chicago Zoo in 1948. Kansiram and other rhinos sent from Assam were received with a warm welcome in their respective host cities. Such international recognition for the rhino came at a particular moment for the Assamese intelligentsia. Whether Assam was amply known to the rest of India and the world was a question that had long concerned the Assamese people. From the early 20th century, the Assamese intelligentsia focused immensely on showcasing their rich cultural and political heritage by discovering ancient Assamese texts and antiquity. Rhino fulfilled this quest for recognition. After independence, the government of Assam also invested heavily to popularize the rhino and make Assam a tourist destination. Ministers and top op ranking officials micromanagement the advertisements like the one on your screen. In 1954, the government inaugurated a luxury tourist clause in Kaziranga. Politicians, senior officials jostled for a stay here to watch rhinos in the sanctuary. Thus, in the mid 1950s, Kaziranga has a distinct place in the imagination of Assamese elites, and it was also entering the space of Assamese middle class. Besides the Assamese elites, Assamese government servants, journalists, college students filled the rush in Kaziranga. It is noteworthy to mention that EPG, a planter turned naturalist of British origin, wrote relentlessly in popular presses and scientific magazines to popularize the rhino and Kaziranga. So much, much of what comes to us from 1950s is through EPG's writings. But there were also the complex questions of rights inside the sanctuary. Salim Ali, in his widget report, recommended a complete ban on grazing and forest use in Kaziranga sanctuary. The forest department was headed by P.D. Tracy, an Anglo-Indian who has left be behind an immense corpus of writings on wildlife management, especially the elephants. 
Stressy camped in Kaziranga to evaluate the existing rides, and he observed, and I quote, Rhinos are moving freely near the khutis or the livestock camps, as I saw for myself, and if we insist on inoculation of the cattle, we can guard against epidemics. Moreover, our thinly scattered staff in the northern side require some assistance to remain there. If nothing else, they get help from the khutiwalas when needed, unquote. So the forest department clearly needed the grazier's support to patrol the porous and fluid riverine borders in the north. Therefore, existing graziers were allowed to keep their cattle on the northern fringes. Similarly, along the southern boundary, the colonial government allowed the villagers to graze as an arrangement to offset damages caused by wildlife on their crop. It was simply impolitic to remove them. Now the villagers had the support of powerful politicians too. This hard negotiations for their rights inside the sanctuary aside, the base for conservation was growing among the peasants as well. There can be no better example than Budagunda, meaning an old solitary bull in Assamese. Budagunda grazed on the sanctuary's edge alongside the domestic cattle for at least 14 years during 1939 to 1953. There were several such old bulls pushed by younger mills to sometimes totally unpatrolled edges of Kajiranga sanctuary. The survival of the solitary bull suggests two things to me. First, the rhino could survive in semi-modified landscapes like floodplains, as opposed to the view that only wilderness can protect them. Secondly, although the sanctuary meant certain irritation due to restrictions and wildlife damage, most peasants preferred the rhino alive than dead. The rhino was a promise of global attention and better infrastructure and economy for the locality. It is not to say that the peasants didn't kill the rhino. A low-skill rhino killing always existed. Rhino hunting was no longer associated with power and masculinity. Killing the rhino solely for its horn was considered a lowly act. Thus, rhino killing escalated only in the times of prolonged rural distress. So the government capitalized the government through the forest department capitalized on this social restraint to protect the rhino. For instance, between 1951 to 1957, Arsidas, a school teacher turned sanctuary official, actively engaged with the community to keep rhino hunting under check. Das often accompanied the high school boys to the sanctuary, evidently to make them more conservation minded. Even in 1960, when the number of guards was increased several times, there were only 55 men to patrol an area of 430 square kilometers. Add the trouble of navigating swamps and rivulets and grasses that grow up to 11 to 15 feet tall. Thus, instead of strict protection, the government in the early years after independence relied on conserving the rhino through moderate protection and accommodation of rural rights. The graziers and villagers were expected to support the forest department in protecting the rhino. Just a quick summary so far. Independence brought new enthusiasm to protect the rhino for the Assamese intelligentsia who had an enduring concern if Assam was known in the rest of India or the world found an answer in the rhino. The government of Assam made ambitious attempts to popularize the rhino globally. In doing so, it developed a niche among the Assamese elites and middle class who took pride on the rhino and filled the rush in Kajiranga. There was also a growing social base for the rhino among the rural peasants. The government relied on this social restraint rather than strict protection to conserve the rhino, at least in the 1950s. The government carried forward the grazing and fishing rights, which existed more a limited level since the colonial period. So what was remarkably missing in the case of rhino in the first two decades was the absence of any ecological research. I'll return to it later to say why did it mean for the rhino. Back to Kajiranga, let's look at what else was happening. The 1950 earthquake in Assam raised the beds of the Brahmaputra, bringing an unprecedented spell of flood and land erosion. While India embarked into refugee settlement and industrial modernization in the 1950s, 
Kajiranga surrounding rill under flood and erosion. Hundreds were driven into landlessness. We need to understand that the low-lying areas where Kajiranga sanctuary was constituted were some of the last remaining areas for expanding cultivation in the Brahmaputra Valley. The sanctuary's neighborhood had a number of grazing reserves, which also served as buffers between the wildlife habitat and the villages. Landless villagers cleared these buffers in search of land. One of the key issues the government had to address was the mounting landlessness in the state. So the political climate overwhelmingly favored such squatting over grazing reserves. The government periodically issued land titles to the occupants in such grazing reserves. The crisis was so acute that a 2,100-acre grazing reserve turned into village and crop field in less than a decade in the sanctuary's east. Withering buffers was the worst fear the forest department official worst fear for the forest department officials because it would bring more pressure on the sanctuary's resources. 1949, Vishnu Ram Medhi, the revenue minister and the la later chief minister of Assam, visited Kajiranga. His visit led to proposals to create animal corridors between the sanctuary and the Karbi Hills in the south. A politician's keenness in the late 1940s to create animal corridor is probably unusual. The proposal did not materialize for more than a decade. Government was keen on protecting the rhino, but not at the cost of cultivators. When the corridor was created in 1960s, it was only in the one-tenth of the originally proposed area. So in the 1950s, sporadic issues of uh, rhino killing did not make a buzz. However, from around 1960, Assamese media reported an extraordinary scale of rhino killing for its horn in Kajiranga. We don't have records for 1961 to 1964, but during 1965 to 1970, at least 55 rhinos fell to illegal rhino hunters. Amid landlessness and acute poverty, Bands of peasants entered the park to trap rhino in its pit and hack its horn. What exactly led the peasants to enter the sanctuary to hack the horns? I interviewed people who engaged in illegal rhino killing during the 1960s. They explained that it was to secure rights. I was unimpressed. So were their younger relatives who listened to our conversations. Then I went back to survey the police records and newspapers reports of the 1950s and 60s. Police records said a shikari engaged a laborer to dig a rhino trapping pit by paying rupees 100 and one share of rice. The rice, the stable to life, was so dear in the 1960s that it was central to crime in and around the park. Take another instance, which was not related to rhino killing. Rice was so central even to other petty crimes. Once sanctuary guards left their camp for petroleum, they returned to find that their entire supply of rice was stolen. The graziers were allowed inside the sanctuary testified against powerful illegal hunters and deposited rhino horns when they collected from the dead rhinos to the forest department. But there were also the wrong ones among them. Rhino killing exposed the efficacy of older patterns of rhino protection through community engagement. It also brought the loyalty of graziers and peasants to protect the rhino into, uh, rhino into question. I asked a villager, when did the illegal rhino killing start in Kajiranga? He said around 1960. I asked him why. He replied, the forest department taught everyone how to kill the rhino. I was stunned, but he had a point. Forest department caught the rhino using the same skill which the hunters had long mastered. Only difference was that the forest department wanted the live rhinos. So they removed the bamboo spike at the bottom of the pit. The point I'm trying to make here is that the departmental catching operations helped spread a skill known by a small number of people to wider comments. Please note the sheer number of men on, men on this picture of a departmental catching. 
This knowledge multiplied at a time when the sanctuary's neighborhood was reeling under distress and hunger. Please do not get me wrong. Men entering the sanctuary to kill rhinos multiplied, but there was still a minuscule share of the peasants in the neighborhood. The nexus led by the led by local petty traders, unlike an the nexus was led by the local petty traders, unlike an international racket that operates today. It was not just the rhino killing that captured the newspaper headlines in the 1960s. Assamese nationalists wanted to make Assamese the official language of Assam, which the Bengali speakers registered, resulting into riots. The issue of illegal immigrants adding to Assam's scarce resources became a highly politicized issue in the 1960s. Tribal groups were gradually moving away with separate hill states or union territories like Nagaland and Mizoram. The issue of rhino killing joined the long list of anxieties of the Assamese people in the 1960s. And it came at a particular moment to strike a chord with threats to Assam's territorial integrity. Please observe the cartoon titled Division of Rhino from 1966. Assam is written on the rhino's back. The man carries a fl flag of separate hill state. The shown is trying to chop the rhino. The cartoon not only equates rhino with, with Assam's territorial integrity, but also exemplifies the shared vulnerability of Assam and the rhino. The rhino was an Assamese pride. Reports of rhino killing angered the Assamese speaking people, politicians, and artists alike. Oranyo, an Assamese film, started its making just when the large scale rhino killing began in the early 1960s. Popular culture, such as Assamese films like Oranyo, tapped into the concerns of rhino protection. As I mentioned earlier, it was not as if the entire neighborhood was bent on wiping off the rhinos. There were concerned local citizens too. There were sincere efforts to regain the community uh, help in controlling rhino killing. Several MLAs from ruling and opposition parties met villagers in Kajiranga in January 1968. Four weeks later, suspected rhino killers shot a young forest guard dead inside the sanctuary the first instance in Kaziranga's history. The issue rattled the press, legislative assembly, and public life in Assam. Newspapers carried angry editorials, and opposition members cornered the government in the legislative assembly for its failure to protect the rhino. So rhino became a new symbol of dissent in Assam. There was a new realization among the political brass that rhinos cannot be protected without strong protection measures. So in response to the unprecedented scale of rhino hunting, illegal rhino hunting in Kajiranga, and the uh, death, the murder of a young forest guard, the government of Assam sent 11 armed home guards to the sanctuary a first in its history. The long shelled plans of converting Kajiranga into a national park were revived. The objectives were to afford it greater protection, attract tourists, and even earn revenue through tourism. Forest officials had been arguing that grazing and fishing were covered to kill rhinos in the park. They also argued that these concessions were made at the cost of wider economic development of Assam, through rhino tourism. These anxieties were also fueled by the fact that the sanctuary lost around 84 square kilometers to the Brahmaputra's erosion during 1912 to 1972. Forest Department convinced the political leaders of the time that the rhino cannot be protected when graziers and fishers had access to the park. Under pressure to protect the rhino, political leaders agreed to the arguments and slowly changed their gear from 
prioritizing agrarian priorities to prioritizing conservation with respect to Kaziranga. The years leading up to the conversion of sanctuary, conversion of sanctuary into a national park deemed most favorable for the forest department to remove graziers and fishers. There was also greater political support for the use of bullets against suspected rhino killers. Since the home guards arrived, encounter became the new buzzword. Locals complained that the armed guards shot even at the fishers and grass cutters. The forest department considerably, if not fully, fused all forms of forest dependency with rhino killing. So even as the Kaziranga rhino reeled under distress, its revival became evident in the mid 1960s. A census in 1966 revealed that there were around 366 to 400 rhinos in the sanctuary alone. In 1970, the government of India appointed an expert committee to assess the state of wildlife in India. The committee was dismayed over the general state of affairs in the country, but it praised Kaziranga as having, an, as having, and I quote, extensive self-contained eco-units, unquote, where nature could take its own course. They were also impressed with the total protection in Kaziranga. However, the committee did not acknowledge that the total protection was only recent, but the success in rhino conservation was long in making through accommodation of rural rights. The members of the committee included Kalas Sankla, who later became the director of Project Tiger. To say that Kaziranga influenced the course of strict tiger reserves under Project Tiger, of future national parks would be an overstatement. The influence was rather shuttle. Instead, Kaziranga gave a visualization that total protection was achievable in national parks and tiger reserves. So I move on to the concluding remarks this evening. So during the period discussed here, Kaziranga achieved several milestones. First, it gave India the first taste of success in conserving a big mammal. The success came through the efforts of regional political leadership. Chronology is important. Rhino's revival predated the Wildlife Protection Act 1972, which is considered a hallmark of Indian conservation. Thus, Rhino's revival in this period takes us to the more decentralized, local, and inclusive approaches of conservation in the past. This is in sharp contrast to a vertical and exclusive approach championed by Project Tiger and the current conservation paradigm. Secondly, the road to this success was not straight. During this period, the park lost a significant portion of its buffers to the agrarian and ecological crisis in its surrounding. Human dependency on Kajiranga for resources increased. So did the intensity and scale of conflicts. Thirdly, as I mentioned at the beginning, no significant ecological research on Kajiranga was done. Some Assam-based scholars undertook some painstaking research on the rhino, but cutting edge research methods deployed in other rhino habitats like the Chitwan National Park in Nepal are still missing. Rhino's emotive place in Assam's public life rescued it when it was under distress. But the rhino is beyond a cultural symbol and emotive object. It needs science in its management. The absence of science in public discourse can pose conservation challenges. The local opposition to rhino reintroduction in the 1980s is a case in point. This also resonates with the case of gear lions in Gujarat, where an alternate form is still in waiting. Lastly, hitherto, the regional politics on rhino has somehow towered over the grassroots politics in Kaziranga. This is because the local politics was too localized. The park now includes the entire bed of the Brahmaputra in its sixth edition. It brings the interaction between wildlife and humans to a much wider geography. The expansion of the local issues will reshape the politics in a decade or so, 
conservation approaches must attend to this newer interactions and the reshaping of politics around conservation in the park's periphery. I conclude. Thank you.